Hello everyone. I wanted to give you guys an update on everything that has gone on since I have been back from my trip to Michigan to shoot for an entire week. Um, just to give you guys an update on how the shoot went. It went incredible. It was like amazing. There are certain things that happened during that shoot that were like, the odds of it happening were like less than none, basically. <laughs> Like 0.001% something happened that we were lucky enough to experience, I guess, and record. So I'm so excited for that and to show you guys everything we've got. We're now going to be working on a second trailer. This is going to show actually and reflect all the work that we've done. That first trailer was actually cut when we had only interviewed one person and we needed to use that to fundraise and get enough support to make this film. So nobody has really seen all of the work that we've done and the trailer that we have right now isn't really reflective of that, although I love it and it is fantastic. We have to, um, we've got to beat that one though. So we, I just got back um, from traveling. A lot is going on also, and this is going to be, I'll do a separate video to talk about that because I actually have to get serious, I guess, um, to talk about something. Like, that. that's personal stuff, though. I'll just say there's a lot of stressful things going on right now. All five of the men, the Whitmer guys, are being prevented from calling me. They're blocking my phone number, even though I was approved for phone calls. And um, it's just very, I guess, frustrating and upsetting. Although we do have some good news today, and I'm actually going to be breaking some news for you guys. If I get this up before five, uh, we're going to be covering two filings. I'm going to start with Joe Morrison's appeal brief. This is not just for Joe Morrison. It's Paul as well. Um, I believe those lawyers, the state guys, the state lawyers were working together for this as far as I know. And then we're gonna look at the latest filing from today, it will be from today, for Adam Fox and Barry Croft. As you guys know, the Sixth Circuit is currently considering taking up their cases. And if you guys remember, we had oral arguments in front of a three-judge panel at the Sixth Circuit. Now that panel had asked for both sides, so the government and the defense, to um, basically, they were to provide a brief to answer the question of if all of the exculpatory evidence that was withheld from the jury and hidden from the jury, if it was allowed, would that have substantially changed the outcome of the case? We all know the answer to that is a resounding yes. Clearly, that first trial ended in two acquittals and a mistrial on Adam and Barry. So they were very, very close to acquitting Adam and Barry. This information would have made all of the difference. So yes, these men are entitled to a new trial based, again, on multiple reasons, not just the withholding of exculpatory evidence. There was a lot of improper things that occurred, including the lack of a Remmer hearing and many other issues that were raised in the appeals briefs. But this is the Judge Yonker's bogus hearsay ruling is the main issue I believe that they're focusing on. And I'm happy about that because that, to me, there's no point in giving these men a new trial if they cannot introduce the exculpatory evidence and they can't call witnesses, you know? Otherwise, you're just giving them, it's just a redo of the same thing. And that would be almost like double jeopardy. So anyways, I want to go here, though, first to the state guys. And I'm going to give you an update on what's happening with that. This was just filed uh, recently, the People versus Joe Morrison. Uh, they are filing a notice of hearing certificate of service motion for post-conviction relief, index of exhibits, and a supporting brief. So let me just uh, go over this with you guys. There's a hearing coming up on Friday, July 19th at 9 a.m., uh, and this is for the defendant's motion for directed verdicts of acquittal, motions for new trial, and motion for resentencing or to correct the judgment will be heard before, again, Judge Wilson, who oversaw the trial. 
Why is he overseeing his own appeal? Anybody who's from Michigan, maybe you guys can enlighten me about this. I don't know. Your girl must be really dumb. I've never seen where a judge has made improper rulings and that is appealed that it would go to the same judge. The whole purpose of an appeal is to basically get a second opinion, right? Is to have a different person review the judge's work, another judge, just to see if there was a judicial error because sometimes that happens. Judges are not perfect. They're not infallible. They make mistakes. They make errors at times. And so... No, this is unacceptable to me that Judge Wilson is overseeing his own appeal of his rulings. He's not going to disagree with his rulings. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so stupid and it's just a waste of time. They're just trying to drag this out to keep these guys in there for as long as possible. So let me bring up this part. Motion for directed verdict of acquittal, motions for new trial, motion for resentencing or to correct the judgment, renewed motion for bond. First of all, none of these men should be incarcerated. Half of them have been acquitted. Since this trial, more evidence and information has come out, including the three-hour interrogation of Steve Robeson. Hello, new evidence would uh predicate reopening the case you would assume not in america though so um let me read some of this to you guys defendant substitutes the previously filed motion for new trial or resentencing concurrence in co-defendant circuit court motions rather than repeating arguments morrison is joining the argument he understands beller will make before the court regarding whether an entrapment defense should have been given to the jury. Newsflash, it should have. Five men have been acquitted in this case based on an entrapment defense by two different juries. Sir, honestly, Judge Wilson, joins arguments made by Musico in the motion and brief filed on his behalf. Yeah, I'm not happy with Musico's court-appointed appellate lawyer. And if you're watching and listening, you guys need to get your act together. I'm watching everything you're doing. Not just me, but a lot of other people are watching as well. And if you're not doing your duty, we will um, expose you for the clowns that you are. So let's talk about this. Relevant proceedings and facts. Now, I wanted to bring this up because there are some interesting things in uh, Joe Morrison's brief that I have not even seen in Adam Fox's brief about Adam, which is, hello, bizarre. And yet here we are because we have different lawyers for, these, for the case, even in the case is so massive. And so we learned from Joe Morrison's brief that the FBI apparently at some point offered money to Adam Fox. They were trying to give him money to get him to buy, like, uh, weapons with it or something. You know what he wanted to use it for? Paintball guns. Paintball guns. Hello. Like, when I said he was childlike, that's what I meant. So, they begin, the FBI orchestrates yet another... DT plot, reviewing the major events in the state's timeline from Dublin, Ohio to the Vac Shack in Grand Rapids, from Cambria, Wisconsin to Luther, Michigan, Morrison was not present. Yet the jury was told he should be held responsible for the stoned and drunken trash talk that occurred at those events. From that supposition, they should discern that Morrison was involved in a DT plot. There's no evidence that the people at said events could uh, blow up a microwave oven, much less a concrete interstate bridge, as the FBI would claim. Yeah, how ridiculous. By summer's end of 2020, despite the time and money invested, the FBI's efforts were failing. In a final push, the FBI cobbled together two drive-bys of Governor Whitmer's cottage after clearing the date and time with the governor's staff coordinating in advance. That's Whitmer's, Whitmer's team's coordinating something Joe Morrison knows nothing about. He's not there for it. She arguably is more responsible for this than him, and he's the one sitting in federal prison despite not being charged federally. Yeah. 
uh, afterward, together with their press releases, the state brought criminal charges against Morrison, DT, gang membership, material support for a T Act, and felony firearm. The T charge was so weak it did not survive a preliminary examination. That's right, they actually had to drop some of the charges they tried to move forward because even the courts were like, don't be absurd, guys. I mean, the whole thing is absurd, but that's telling you how really absurd it actually was. The trial centered on angry but harmless political speech. During the 14-day trial, the government was never called upon to name with specificity the act of DT Morrison supposedly supported or the specific act he did to support the T. For a detailed summary of the record, see the attached brief. Because of the enormity of the record, summary is tailored to assignments of error that are being briefed. Now, Morrison was found guilty before the jury. At age 28 years old, he had no prior felony record. He was sentenced to 4 to 20 years. And then he got other charges and all run consecutively. Now... The motions. Motion for new trial. Evidence not presented. Issue one. Important evidence was not presented at the entrapment hearing or jury trial held in this matter. Neither the trial court nor the jury were told that the FBI was offering money to lure their targets into their uh, kidnapping hoax. As late as August 9, 2020, the DT, Adam Fox, wanted to use his FBI money to purchase paintball guns. Like, literally. Neither the trial court nor jury were told that at some of the DT gatherings, there were sign-in sheets in which the attendees used their real names and signatures. Oh, but Maopsek, what could be more reflective of an absence of consciousness of guilt? So what he means by that is if you're holding a meeting to plan a big DT act, you know, according to the government, the biggest DT plot in a generation, are you going to sign your name in? If the government's arguing you're employing encrypted chats to, you know, have OPSEC, and they say that by definition, you using the word OPSEC means that you're admitting that there's some kind of operation or whatever. Why would you put your, it doesn't make sense. That's, and when you go through all of this, none of it makes sense. And this is, you guys are starting to see all of the things I've seen. The FBI created 10 colorful charts based on conversations they secretly recorded. An FBI agent testified at the Croft Box trial. It took her three weeks to create these high value exhibits. The charts, however, were not admitted at Morrison's trial. Other names of other members of Morrison's group, the Wolverine Watchmen, appear in these charts, but not Morrison's. The chart contradicts the claim Morrison was involved in a DT plot and contradicts the claim he was a leader, which he was sentenced, by the way. He had leadership enhancement on his sentencing. He wasn't a leader. Guess who the leader was? Dan Chappelle. Dan Chappell, Chappelle, however you want to say it. The FBI created the Michigan Patriot 3 Percenter Group Adam Fox belonged to and other Patriot 3 Percenter groups in different states. Yes, the targets of the FBI, in particular Croft and Fox, were stoned and drunk at nearly every major event recorded by the feds. These facts put their angry remarks in their right context unsober, unserious talk. And, you know, they're not supposed to use intoxicated statements in court anyways because you're in an altered state of consciousness. It's not reflective of your normal disposition, okay? Uh, although Morrison and his co-defendants were not present for the FBI arranged drive-bys, details of the drive-bys show the unseriousness of the DT plot and the frivolity of the DTs. The only serious plotter in this matter was the FBI. Agent Impala strategized about sowing confusion and chaos to win at trial. Yeah. For reasons which are unclear from the record and require an evidentiary hearing to elucidate, these important topics of evidence were not presented in the matter. Mm-hmm. Now, motion for direct verdicts of acquittal protects the accused against a conviction except upon proof 
beyond a reasonable doubt of every fact necessary to constitute the, the crime with which he is charged. Here, the quantity of evidence cannot cure the defects in the quality of evidence. Uh, Morrison abandoned the DTs. In an investigation spanning seven months and terabytes of data, the state, rather than offering clear evidence of a plan to commit DT, instead focused on Morrison's constitutionally protected anti-government sentiments. But the state was required to present evidence of Morrison's intent, knowledge, and agreement to a, quote, act of DT. There is no proof beyond a reasonable doubt Morrison shared any unity of purpose with Fox or Croft to do anything to a governor, and they didn't want to do anything either. They have to say this because they, Adam and Barry have been convicted, so because they're part of the legal system, they can't disagree with it, basically. Although they sort of do in here, they still have to refer to them as the convicted, you know, whatever. Now, getting into the statutory language problem, the Michigan Anti-T Act defines the terms Act of T and T. And if you're asking, if you're wondering why I'm using abbreviations instead of reading that word that you can read right there on the screen, it's because YouTube likes to uh, bury us in the algorithm if we say certain code words, keywords. I'll put the links to all of this stuff, though, in the video description. You can read it yourself. Uh, the gang and material support charges required proof beyond a reasonable doubt Morrison knowingly provided material support to Fox and Croft for an act of DT. But what support and what act was pled and proven? The prosecution tried to hedge its bet by offering different theories, but ultimately the act of T they allege was the supposed plot to kidnap the governor. The Court of Appeals, however, in 2016 held kidnapping is not a T act under the statute. See the People versus Quigley, a copy of which accompanies this filing. The statutory analysis underlying Quigley applies here, and it tells us that convictions obtained in this matter are fatally flawed. The prosecution's evidence failed as both a factual matter and on the matter of the statutory language. Um, now, they want a new trial. In the 14-day trial, which involves complex issues, the jury instructions occur over a mere 15 pages and guarantee almost all of them written by the government. A detailed instruction was given to the jury, listen to this, to ignore the defense of entrapment. What? But no other instruction on a defense was given. That is insane that they could do that. Such error can constitute ineffective assistance. Hello, this is something I have been screeching about from the rooftops. Ineffective assistance of counsel. What were these court-appointed lawyers doing when those jury instructions were going out? They had a duty to say, no, entrapment is our defense. We want jury instructions on it. So I think they should file um, the ineffective assistance of counsel uh, claims against those lawyers with the Bar Association. Um, all of which I will say, except Mr. Kirkpatrick, because I actually believed he was trying to do his job. But the other ones, no, no. Until you guys reach out to me, I think that you're all scum. For the full argument, please see the attached brief. An instruction on mere presence defense was not given. This, by the way, is important because that was key in the third, or I'm sorry, the fourth uh, trial, the second state case, wherein all three men were acquitted, Eric Molitor and the Null brothers. That was a big part of explaining that, look, your mere presence at an event does not mean that you are intending and consenting to what is happening at the event. Simply being there while somebody else is doing something, for example, that you're not participating in, you can't be you basically can't be charged along with them just because you happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, basically. Assuming, arguendo, that Morrison agreed with others to commit an offense, an instruction on the defense of abandonment or withdrawal was not given. So say that there was some plot, right? And this is just speaking hypothetically because there wasn't an actual plot. But say that there was, right? And Morrison joined. He may have left, though, at a certain point, like he was no longer, we'll just say, 
after June of 2020, Morrison was no longer the leader of anything. He wasn't the leader of the Wolverine Watchmen. He wasn't conducting the trainings. He wasn't calling the meetings. He wasn't doing any of those things. It was Dan Chappell, and everyone knows it. And he, hello, that means it was the FBI. And so also, Paul Beller left the Wolverine Watchmen. He created his own group, which the government, you know, hilariously referred to as the Ghost Group. Uh, that was in July of 2020. By August of 2020, he moves to a different state, okay? He's in South Carolina. So abandonment or withdrawal, again, if there was some kind of pl loose plot at this time that maybe some of these guys agreed to, there still should have been jury instructions on abandoning or withdrawing from it because that still... That is part of their, a defense that could be argued or made. Even though Fox and Croft are the two DTs, Morrison supposedly provided support to, the jury was instructed, quote, that the crime occurred on or about November 1st, 2019 to October 7, 2020. That was before any of the accused had met Fox or Croft. Hello? The accused in a criminal trial have a constitutional right to a unanimous verdict. In most trials, a general instruction on the unanimity requirement will be adequate, but not always, right? The critical inquiry is whether evidence presented by either party to the jury materially distinguished any of the multiple acts which could comprise an offense element. Here the state presented conceptually distinct and separate acts to the alleged manner in which Morrison provided material support and to the T Act. None of these theories satisfy Michigan's anti-T statute, by the way. Whether jurors split on the theory they chose, we will never know. Worse yet, the prosecution told the jury, listen to this, that they did not have to have a unanimous verdict. They did not have to unanimously agree on the factual basis of defendant's guilt. Defense counsel failed to object. Why? Why did they fail to object? I don't know, but I'm, I am disgusted. So let's move on now to the supplemental briefs filed today for Adam and Barry uh, in the Sixth Circuit. Let me get rid of that. Hopefully y'all can read this better now. Okay, so uh, let me just bring this up. We'll start with page one. We're just getting through, you know, the cover pages and stuff like that. All right, so let me explain what this is. This is the consolidated supplemental brief of uh, Adam Fox and Barry Croft. And like I said earlier in the video, I know this has gotten quite long, but let me just breeze through it because this stuff is so important that we had oral arguments at the Sixth Circuit, as you guys know, in front of a three-judge panel that went very well, in my opinion at least, for the defense. Um, they requested, basically, both sides to br write briefs saying if the exculpatory evidence that was withheld, if it had made it through, would this have substantially changed the outcome? That was basically what they were asked to provide briefs on. So the defense filed their briefing, and I'll just go ahead and read some of this to you guys. May 10, 2024, the clerk's office sought supplemental briefing to address the following question. So this is where we talk about, let me just bring this up. So I have this binder here. This contains the filing that they wanted to get in, um, which is Nils Kessler tried to say they didn't have one. Now I have Barry's notes on this, so my version is different from the one that was filed, but this is what it is, okay? These are the out-of-court statements that they wanted to get in. There is 46 pages of these statements. These are all exculpatory statements made by the man, or they're incriminating statements made by FBI agents and informants. So we always keep that on my desk because I always like to read from that of listen to what these informants were saying themselves, okay? And so that's what this is talking about. Assuming the informants out of court statements should have been admitted, that was this 43 page filing they tried to get in, um, 
Was the district court's error in excluding those statements harmful or harmless and why provide citations to the record detailing what was excluded, what was admitted, and explain the effect it had? For ease of presentation and because of their arguments on the issue are the same, basically, Fox and Croft are submitting one consolidated supplemental brief. They'll each file uh, the same thing, basically. They make, they're making the same arguments, so their lawyers essentially work together. Now, let's go through this because this is very, very important. And I'll say this. I think that this is a very good... I have a very good feeling because the Sixth Circuit seemed to have that three-judge panel like they knew the case, okay? They knew at least some of it, which means, and I take this, and I think that the appeals lawyers do too, take it to mean that they studied this case more than they do other cases that come up to them, right? Because the Sixth Circuit, there's a lot of people who want their cases appealed at the Sixth Circuit, who are requesting that the Sixth Circuit take up their cases. Sometimes they go through this stuff very quickly. In this case, it shows that there's some interest here uh, with the Sixth Circuit. That is a good thing. In my opinion, I feel like that means the work that we've done maybe is fruitful. Because think about it. I go on lots of channels. I talk about this case endlessly. And the reason I do that is because you never know who out there is listening. You know, if I've gone on Jesse Kelly's program, if I've gone on Emerald Robinson, if I've gone on any of these programs, we don't know who watches and when and who could hear about it. And maybe, maybe I'm just, I'm not tooting my own horn or anything. I'm just saying maybe that is, maybe that had a, con, a contributing factor. So let's go here back to the brief. The, go the government waived a harmless error argument. Yes. Uh, in their briefs, both appellants argued the district court's application of Federal Rules of Evidence 801 D2D was at odds with the court's decision in the United States versus Branham. Uh, the government responded by arguing the district court's application of Branham was appropriate. However, in the last sentence of its brief, the government posited that, quote, even if it had, District Court abused its discretion by excluding exculpatory evidence. Hello, it did. The defendants would not have identified any particular rulings which, had they gone the other way, would have substantially swayed the outcome of the trial, unquote. B.S. The government's failure to develop a harmless error argument surfaced at oral argument May 2nd, 2024. At oral argument, Judge Larson observed, and she's a queen for this, everybody... Everybody. Judge Joan Larson. She is a queen for this. Somebody get her a crown, okay? <laughs> she was, I love this lady. She observed the government was now arguing to the appellate court the district court's handling of the role 801 D2D issue was harmless. However, Judge Larson also noted there was only one sentence in the government's brief hinting at harmlessness, and it was the government's burden to establish that the error was harmless. And so they didn't meet it. The burden is on the government to demonstrate that the error didn't cause any problems. It's not on these men. Although we could argue, I think it's very easy to make the argument that I don't know, hey, if the first trial ended in two acquittals and then a mistrial on Adam and Barry, clearly they were very, very close to acquitting Adam and Barry. Had they been given this Hello, that's a binder of exculpatory evidence, they would have acquitted them too. That is the argument. So therefore, it is not a harmless error. That error quite literally cost these men their freedom. The burden is on the government to demonstrate the error was harmless. Importantly, by relying on such a perfunctory one-sentence discussion of harmless error, the government waived their argument for this. In a habeas case, this court held that, quote, the state did not argue elsewhere in its brief the state's trial court's decision was harmless error. Even appellees waive arguments by failing to brief them. And accordingly, the state has waived any harmless error argument. 
The policy grounds for this result were articulated by Judge Cool in his concurring opinion in Calvert versus William uh, Wilson. In Calvert, the majority opinion affirmed the district court's issuance of the writ after addressing the merits of an issue the state perfunctorily dismissed in a footnote as harmless. In his concurrence, Judge Cool agreed Calvert was entitled to habeas relief, but concluded it was not necessary to reach the merits of the issue because the state waived the harmless error argument. In his opinion, Judge Cool writes, quote, While a petitioner has the responsibility of ensuring all claims in support of a petition for writ of habeas corpus are timely raised, so too does the warden bear the responsibility of ensuring all defenses, including harmless error, are timely raised. Just as a defendant may not save claims for strategic purposes, the state may not place the harmless error defense in an arsenal for safekeeping. In the event it's substantive, constitutional arguments fail. Both parties must present their cards at the outset as a matter of fundamental fairness and judicial economy. Hidden hands should not be encouraged. That's right, Judge Cole. We don't like hidden hands. Judge Cole concluded the harmless argument was waived because the state's appellate brief only mentioned harmless error in a footnote on cursory terms without analysis. Based on this circuit's jurisprudence, as well as the perfunctory way the government raised the harmless error issue in its brief, the issue has been waived. Now. The District Court's Application of Federal Rules of Evidence 801 D2D to deny the, the appell appellant's ability to present their defense was not a harmless error. In the event this court, this court finds that the government has not waived the harmless error issue, the District Court's exclusion of the communications among the agents and informants and their FBI handlers, as well as communications between the agents and informants and between the agents and informants and their targets, including Croft and Fox was not a harmless error. It most certainly was not. Uh, it was very harmful. It literally cost them their freedom. As discussed more below in Part 2C, the error here is of constitutional dimension and is thus subject to Chapman's harmless error standard. That standard requires the government prove beyond a reasonable doubt the error complained of did not contribute to the verdict obtained. The government cannot meet that high burden. Indeed, even under the less rigorous harmlessness standard for non-constitutional errors, uh, Kotiekos versus U.S., the government still fails. It is also noteworthy that the error here does not involve the district court's erroneous admission of evidence which was prejudicial. Instead, it is the court's exclusion of substantive evidence supporting the defendant's affirmative defense of entrapment. Boom! Entrapment is an affirmative defense developed by the Supreme Court and premised on the notion that Congress could not have intended criminal punishment for a defendant who has committed all of the elements of a prescribed offense but was induced to commit them by the government. C. U.S. v. Martin. Entrapment cases are unique because the government must prove the elements of the charged offenses beyond a reasonable doubt, as well as show beyond a reasonable doubt its agents and informants did not entrap the defendants. Jacobson v. the U.S. The importance of this distinction on harmless error analysis between erroneous admission of evidence on the one hand versus barring critical evidence which supports an affirmative defense on the other has been recognized by at least the 2nd, 5th, 7th, 9th, and D.C. circuits. It is pertinent here, too. For example, in U.S. v. Harris, George Harris sought to advance the defense of duress in a narcotics case by arguing that the informant, Stalwart, repeatedly pressured him to arrange a deal. To support his defense, Harris wanted to call his parole officer and lawyer based in Detroit to prove Harris thought Stalwart was a government agent. However, the court excluded these witnesses after concluding, quote, it is plainly blatant hearsay, unreliable, and self-serving. On appeal, the Second Circuit found the district court's handling of this evidentiary issue was an error. The Second Circuit reversed Harris's conviction after finding, quote, courts are particularly reluctant to deem error harmless where the error precludes or impairs the presentation of the accused's sole means of defense, which is very important because entrapment is a sole means of defense. You have no other arguments to make if you were, in fact, 
entrapped by the federal government. That's the only defense you can make. Several years later, this harmlessness error issue arose in the same court, U.S. versus Cohen. Jonathan Cohen and Daniel Lowry were charged with committing white-collar offenses. Lowry wanted to admit statements made to him by Stephen Feloris to show how Feloris solicited and received Cohen and Lowry's assistance in the bank fraud scheme. The admission of these statements was important to demonstrate both that the statements were made and that Lowry believed them to be true. At the time of the trial, Feloris was a co-defendant and fugitive. The district court sustained the government's hearsay objection and excluded Feloris's statements. On appeal, the Sixth Circuit, uh, Second Circuit ruled the statement should have been admitted and the evidentiary error was not harmless. The panel followed the Harris decision and concluded when erroneous evidentiary ruling precludes or impairs the presentation of the defendant's only means of a defense, we are reluctant to deem it harmless because clearly it is not. <laughs> In U.S. versus Carter, Cassius Carter was on trial for receiving and concealing stolen cars. When Carter took the stand, he wanted to tell the jury about his receipt of a vehicle from his cousin. Carter sought to admit conversations he had with his cousin to, quote, bolster his claim that he had no knowledge the Pontiac Catalina allegedly allegedly obtained from his cousin was stolen. The trial court allowed Cassius to tell the jury about what happened, but excluded his cousin's statements as hearsay. On appeal, the Fifth, the Fifth Circuit found the evidentiary ruling was erroneous. Furthermore, the panel concluded that an error cannot be found harmless if it precludes or impairs the presentation of the defendant's sole means of defense. 100%. Uh, U.S. versus Peak. Buford and Benny Peak went on trial on a narcotics conspiracy case. During Buford's case in chief, he testified he intended to capture the government informant by luring him to his place of business. Buford was also asked about a telephone conversation he had with Benny, and the trial court sustained the, the government's hearsay objection. According to the court, anything Benny said during the call was hearsay. Benny sought to admit his statements made in the call during Buford's cross examination to show he lacked the men's Rhea to join the conspiracy. On appeal, the Seventh Circuit found the district court's evidentiary ruling in error and reversed Bernie's conviction. Moreover, they held that it is always perilous to speculate on whether the effect of evidence improperly excluded would have been. The lay mind evaluates evidence differently from the legal mind, and while many appellate judges have substantial experience with juries and perhaps great insight into the thinking process of the jurors, others do not. This is a reason to be weary about in joke, invoking the doctrine of harmless error with regard to evidentiary rulings in jury cases, because the the jury is not as informed as a judge is they think differently the judge cannot know whether excluding the evidence was harmless or not they'll never know all right now let's move on a little bit uh they're making the argument here though about harmless error now it says the excluded uh, 801 D2D admis government admissions and their impact on the entrapment defense. Many of the relevant communications, text, and audio recorded statements, which were barred to the defense as substantive evidence under 801 D2D by the district court's ruling, are identified in the spreadsheet that is this motion here. Uh, it is order before trial one, the district court recognized the basis for the admission of the communications in the spreadsheet was to advance the defendant's case, both on the entrapment theory and an otherwise defending against the conspiracy charge. The defense seeks to admit approximately 258 out-of-court statements. The statements are taken from proposed transcriptions of recorded conversations and originate either from defendants themselves, federal agents, or confidential human sources, a.k.a. FBI informants. However, the district court denied their admission, ruling that the best reading of Branham and Reed is that rule... Uh, 801 D2D covers only those situations where an informant's words and actions are directly and expressly authorized by a government agent. That's absurd. Thus, where the informant's statements merely regurgitate words fed by a government agent, then provided by the offering party can establish relevance, the statement might be admissible. 
The district court concluded its decision by noting that, quote, scripted words which are directly authorized and closely supervised by government agents fairly fall within party opponent exception. This was the court's rubric, which it adopted by analogy from the movie The Truman Show. The court sometimes referred to the role as the Christoph role, uh, Christoph role from the film's character Christoph, played by Ed Harris. Christoph was the director of the live reality TV show in which the Truman, played by Jim Carrey, was unbeknownst to Truman that he lived uh, what he believed was his ordinary life, the main character for the global audience who were addicted to the show. In a footnote, the court observed that, quote, few if any such qualifying statements appear on the defendant's charts. As addressed in Croft's main brief, and not refuted, by the way, the issue was litigated again before Trial 2, with incorporation of many of the same filings included in the spreadsheet. I'm persuaded again the district court made the same ruling as in Trial 1, and it applied the ruling in Trial 2 the same way it had done in Trial 1. Uh, as such, and as developed at the oral argument in this court on May 2nd, 2024, the practical and actual effect of the district court's ruling and its associated Truman Show rubric was that the court completely eliminated 801 D2D from the trial as an evidence rule which could be used to benefit Croft and Fox. Instead, the court collapsed 801 D2D into 801 D2B and C, such that Croft and Fox would get the benefit of federal rules of evidence only for statements which they sought to present against the government that were expressly authorized, even dictated by the supervisory FBI agent in charge of the investigation, Chambers, in a manner similar to Kristoff as he fed lines to characters in The Truman Show. Such a ruling is completely unmoored from the law. It directly contravenes not only Rule 801 D2 and its subpart D, but also the Supreme Court's decision in Sherman versus the U.S. and this court's de decision in U.S. versus Branham. Indeed, when entrapment is one of the issues being tried, the Supreme Court has not only held that a confidential informant is an agent of the government, of course they are, but it is said that at trial the accused may examine the conduct of the government agent, and the government is not permitted to disown its agents and informants and insist it is not responsible for their actions. Boom! Exactly. They're monitoring these people. They know what they're doing at all times. They're briefing them every single day. They're, they're doing debriefings. They know what's happening. They're aware of it all. You know, by their very nature, non-authorized vicarious admissions by a government informant and agent will oftentimes be statements of or conduct which the principal disapproves of, frowns upon, discourages, or flatly prohibits. Rarely, if ever, will such admissions be dictated by the FBI's lead agent in Kristoff fashion into the informant's ear to be regurgitated to the defendants. And if there are such statements, they do not need 801 D2D to be admissible as non-hearsay admissions because they're squarely covered in 801 D2 B and or C so long as the statement was made during the scope of the relationship and while it existed. 801 D2D permits admission as substantive evidence against the government and not merely for impeachment even if the statement would be disapproved or was against directions. That is to say, even if Kristoff would be repulsed if he heard it. To be admissible as a non-authorized vicarious admission, the statement must relate to matters within the scope of the agent's duties. The principal, however, does not have to approve the statement. Indeed, provided the statement relates to a matter within the scope of the agency, it will be admissible even though contrary to the principal's interest and party, as party admissions often are. Absolutely. Uh, Anne Bowen Pollen, party admissions in criminal cases, should the government have to eat its words. The district court's order with its allowance of 801D2 admissions against the government of only those statements which were expressly approved or dictated in stenographic fashion by the principal as its self-authored, self-approved statements had the prejudicial effect of enabling the government to disown its own agents and informants and insist it was not responsible for their actions, especially to 
Jenny Plunk, and Steve Robeson, but also Dan Chappell, too, in large measure. And it denied Croft and Fox a meaningful opportunity to examine the conduct of government agents, as was central to their entrapment defense. Sherman guarantees an accused right to examine the conduct of such active government informers, which Plunk, Robeson, and Chappell all were for all relevant times on and before October 7, 2020. Not merely the, go uh, the conduct of paid FBI employees who recruited, supervised, deployed, and rewarded those informants. The district court, by effectively disabling 801 D2D for this trial, permitted only the latter and to some extent and disallowed the former almost entirely. As so understood, with the court's subject order disabling the defense from any reliances on 801 D2D and thereby allowing defendants to use as admissions only those statements, texts, and communications that satisfied 801 D2B or C, the prejudicial impact of the court's order was profound. It impacted the entire trial, of which the items of the spreadsheet are only examples, by the way. Reviewing the 258 entries on the spreadsheet, the following chart depicts the communications by item number as listed in the spreadsheet, whose admission as substantive evidence in support of defendant's entrapment defense was barred by the court's erroneous ruling, which the items grouped into relevant topics identified below as pertinent to that defense. I love this, by the way, that they did this because I had been doing essentially the same thing with my color-coded um, things here. So they're breaking it down by different topics uh, in the statements. I'd been doing that using color-coded tabs. So I just think that's so cool. <laughs> oh my god, I'm there's something wrong with me. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Color-coded organization is a good thing. Topics in which the defense wanted to develop to help demonstrate entrapment. Chambers, Robeson, Chapel, et al. organized the Cambria and Luther FTXs and promoted them to the group and recruited attendants by Croft. Chambers, Robeson, Chapel, and other agents promoted and ran the Peebles event. Chambers, Chapel, Robison, and other government agents engaged in a persistent and continuous push for conspirators to come up with a plan or objective, and they pushed a plan. Chambers, Chapel, Robison, Plunk, and other agents engaged in continuous efforts to lead and guide thinking of conspirators, quote unquote, about activities and goals, persuade them to be involved in vouching for Fox and or his ideas. Chambers, Robison, Chapel, and other informants promoted availability of free money to help fund the group's goals. Chambers, Chapel, Robeson, Chambers, Plunk knew other, quote, conspirators did not like or trust Barry Croft and or believed he was not interested. Chambers and Chapel planned, organized, promoted, and conducted the August 29 daytime drive-by or daytime recon of the governor's cottage in trip to the, Bull, the Red Bull Tavern. It's actually called the Oasis Red Bull Tavern there, um, but okay. Uh, Chambers and Chapel planned, organized, promoted, and conducted the Luther uh, nighttime recon. That was September 12, 2020, where Barry thought he was going to do land navigation training. And when he got in the car and Special Agent Timothy Bates, posing as UCE Red, said, do these guys even know where we're going? And Barry in the back seat goes, destination unknown, destination unknown. He has no idea what he's being invited to go do. He does not know that they're going to look at the governor's vacation cottage. He believes he's going to do land navigation training that night. And that's what he told other witnesses, by the way, who were there at the Luther FTX. And this is something that blows my mind that this was not, that these witnesses weren't called at trial to talk about what they saw. You'll see it in the documentary though. Chambers, Bates, Red, Chapel, etc. promoted the use of explosives, including the FBI's homemade uh, B video. Chambers, Chapel pushed for action before spring and wanted events even sooner. Chambers, Chapel, and Bates slash Red planned, organized, promoted, and conducted the Ypsilanti ruse trip on October 7, the day these men were arrested, they were told they were going to get free gear. They, the government lied and said they were going to put a down payment on 
uh, explosives to take out a bridge, which is just ludicrous and nonsensical. By grouping into the above topics, Croft and Fox are best able to show the extent of the exclusions and to more effectively address their impact on Trial 2. These are not, by the way, the only items and evidence that were barred and or impacted uh, by the trial court's ruling. Due to the district court's ruling and its firm adherence to it in Trial 2, the accused defendants were forced to walk a tightrope at trial whereby they were not permitted to utilize 801 D2D government admissions as the non-hearsay substantive admissions which under the law they're supposed to be. When admissions are contained in text or recorded conversation, the accused defendants were not permitted to present the admissions to jury as admissions. Best evidence, i.e. by, for example, admitting a paper copy of of the messages playing and admitting the audio or admitting the document. This limitation on the use of government admissions was most dramatic with Steve Robeson and Jennifer Plunk, both of whom did not testify and in Robeson's case invoked his Fifth Amendment right not to do so. As such, the defense was denied the ability to use the admissions of Robeson and Plunk as made to the alleged conspirators as part of Robeson and or Plunk's efforts on behalf of the government to develop a, quote, trusting relationship with the defendants and the defendants. The defense was likewise denied use of the admissions as revealed in communications between Plunk and or Robeson on the one hand and an FBI employee agents, on the other hand, who provided them with their directions. The same limitation was also very significant as to many of the substantive evidence non-hearsay admissions by Dan Chappell, even though Chappell did testify, and especially his texts and other communications with the alleged conspirators and his responsive texts and other communications with his handlers, his FBI handlers. Under the court's Truman Show rubric, a number of texts written by Chambers to Chapel as directions to Chapel were admitted as authorized statements, but not Chapel's responses. Unfreaking believable. It was so ridiculous. Below are examples of the government's 801 D2D admissions that were excluded or greatly limited within some of the relevant topics. So let's look at that. Now, getting into this, Chambers, Robeson, Chapel organized and planned the FTXs and ran the Peebles event. The involvement of the government informants in planning, organizing, and inviting attendees to the key events at which alleged quote-unquote conspirators supposedly hatched their plans was a critical aspect of an entrapment defense, especially when it was the government's agents and informants who repeatedly suggested ideas and demanded plans. Croft only attended four events during the subject period from June 6, 20, that's the night of the Dublin meeting at the Jewelry Inn, to the arrest October uh, 7 and 8. He attended Dublin, Cambria, Peebles, and Luther, and the government and its informants and agents were the promoters, organizers, orchestrators, and planners of all of them, and their level of planning and related hectoring for plans and objectives were unrelenting. On June 22, 2020, Robeson Facebook post, quote, an event scheduled for the group FTX Cross Train Multi-State multi-state remember i said they wanted it to be a multi-state plot july 11 through 12 cambria forge road cambria wisconsin hosted by steve roby he was going by the name steve roby during this time he also i found multiple i'll just say fake identities this man was using there was another name he was going by altogether so he, he, he invited everybody to, he created the Cambria FTX, he advertised it on Facebook. Uh, July 11, 2020, Cha uh, Chapel texting with Agent Impala tells him that he got Croft to agree to come to the Luther FTX, which suggests Croft did not make the decision to go on his own. Chapel tells Impala, I have Croft coming to Michigan to train. The Luther event was not to occur until September, two months later, yet Chapel and Chambers were already setting up the scam to be sure Croft would be there. They already had their pre-election timeline firmly in mind. They also aggressively promoted the Cambria, Wisconsin event for the weekend of July 10 through 12, 2020. On July 7, 2020, Chapel in audio communication, quote, so like Wisconsin is, I don't know what all went on in Ohio, but there was basically some put out for feelers about, 
you guys can give your interpretation of it of offensive training. That's what I was kind of getting a vibe on. Um, basically getting ideas for a what if kind of thing. So Wisconsin is going to be like mount training kind of thing. So like live fire capabilities. I don't know who's all going. I know there's a few states involved out here. I'm going. Adam is going. The brothers are going, right? I just want whoever's going to be open-minded to whatever they're going to be putting out there. So here is Chapel telling people like Wisconsin, we're going to talk about maybe sort of this offensive training thing, but it's for a what if scenario. So he was presenting this, by the way, as like training for hypothetical scenarios and they were trying to scare people with fear mongering that there was going to be some type of civil war scenario or whatever so i am very pleased to see this i'm very pleased with this supplemental brief i think that um nolder and sweeney have done very good with this i'm happy to see it uh this video has gotten way too long i know it's uh, about an hour long now. I am going to include the links for those filings in the video description so you can read the rest of it for yourself. But this is very good news and I'm very pleased about it. All right, guys. See you next time.